one of our real problems is not just military power it's information power look china did something quite extraordinary it it basically abolished absolute poverty something that the un secretary general you know praised china for and yet that was not front page news around the world i'm a enormous proponent of um asianism in 1947 in delhi um the government of jawaharlal nehru hosted an asian relations conference in 1947 the principal issue of that conference was the independence for indonesia um the support of asian countries for the indonesian people fight against um the return of the dutch after the defeat of the japanese in 1948 asianism is a very compelling idea mm. and i think that what blocks asianism today are a couple of things the first mm. thing is that the united states and has come to believe this after the end of world war 2 that it is the so called security guarantee for some asian countries so the united states military presence around asia is considerable and dangerous um i'm talking about the bases that run from japan all the way down to the straits of malacca in singapore um i mean it's incredible that the united states is not a signatory to the international laws of the seas and yet uses that treaty to conduct so called freedom of navigation exercises um off the coastline not only of china i mean Ch- china has it directly in the gun sites but also iran um you will remember that us warships um you know go and dance around the persian gulf uh, threatening the iranian coastline so one is the united states which has utilized its military and economic power to divide asia uh, to create blocks from the manila pact of 19 54 i believe um the baghdad pact and so on the terrible violence in indonesia in 1965 which overthrew the government of sukarno uh, played an incredible role that plus the war on vietnam these played an incredible role by the united states to divide asia that's one author and we asian countries need to think about our role in facilitating the us entry mm-hmm. um you know the so called border dispute mm-hmm. could be easily resolved you know china and myanmar solved their border problems in the 1950s why has india and china why have they not been able to solve this problem um is it seriously territorial uh, is it really about aksai chain and is it really about mm-hmm. arunachal are these the real issues or is there something underneath that and i really feel like we you know we should create some sort of intellectuals forum uh, about the question of the divides between india and china because this gap this is a real gap and i agree with you economic trade is going to increase that's inevitable but these gaps remain and i think this gap between india and china is to my mind one of the principal reasons for the lack of progress on pan asian development um it's the principal reason it's not to do with south korea or japan or these are petty issues that are provoked by the influence of the united states in india we always we learnt as children about the chinese travelers that came across the himalayas we learnt about buddhism going to bamiyan and then eventually into china um you know we learnt about rabindranath tagore and his role uh, his visits to china and and my grandfather was part of a medical brigade that came to china in the 1920s um you know we have lots of histories in common but this gap has to be closed yeah it's a a, a problem you know china has solved the land border disputes with all uh, countries except india and bhutan and for bhutan it's mainly because of india uh, because india has a tremendous impact influence over bhutan and between china and uh, india i agree with you if we are both broad minded 
we can solve the issue really uh, uh, in a way you know conducive to both countries. And um, yet uh, on my part, perhaps with slight Chinese bias, the main difficulty is with the uh, Indian side. Mainly, I've been to India four times. Uh, one is the Indian military, which still has a very strong memory of the 1962 war. Yeah. And the other is uh, India's media. There is always a very strong voice against China. Always. Yeah. And then with India's political system, it's a Western style democracy or whatever you call it. Uh, so uh, the media and military always have very strong influence. Now, the Chinese approach is uh, uh, first, as you mentioned, in the history of China and India over thousands of years, in most of the time, we are friends. This uh, border conflict is really minor in the long history between the two countries. The other is uh, let's adopt approach what we call the mutual understanding and mutual accommodation. So that's how China solved border disputes with all its neighboring countries, including with Russia. It's different because we have a system which you have a central government led by a communist party, which can really have a long vision and plan for the future. The India's political system is much more uh, full of, uh, how should I say, changes, you know. So it takes really statesmanship rather than politicians, to make a decision. If both sides have statesmen, it can be resolved within months. It's interesting that you mentioned the border between Russia and China, before that the Soviet Union and, and the PRC. Um, that border dispute was settled only recently, and it was settled pretty quietly. That's what mm -hmm. I find interesting. There was almost no fanfare. Well, the border dispute became secondary yeah. to the other things that linked China and Russia. The border dispute, in a sense, was not the principal dispute. Um, once it became clear that China and Russia needed to intensify trade relations, that they needed to have closer security ties, um, that you know, when the BRICS was falling apart, when Brazil India and South Africa began to move slightly away, all that was left was R and C. And it was a consequence of that that made the border dispute irrelevant. Um, you know, in that sense, we need to understand that I think what is going to make the border dispute between India and China irrelevant is what you said earlier, increased trade, um, yeah. increased mutual understanding of benefits. Um, the point you made about the media is a very important point. Um, there is a lack of, I think, a generosity about what's happening in different parts of the world. I, I tell you, it's a funny business. Um, we are actually, if, if I was to look at the numbers, we looked at $2 trillion in military spending. One of our real problems is not just military power, it's information power. Look, China did something quite extraordinary. It, it basically abolished absolute poverty, something that the UN Secretary General, you know, praised China for. And yet, that was not front page news around the world. No. You know, that should have been front page news in every newspaper in South Africa, in, in Algeria, everywhere. No, the West immediately began to say Russian figures, uh, sorry, the Chinese numbers are wrong. They are fudging the numbers and so on. So that became the story. Now, now look at the disadvantage we are at today. And I think that is one of the fundamental problems between yeah. a country like India and China yeah. is that um, most countries in the world have to absorb information. And yeah. dare I say it, quote unquote, wisdom um, yeah. from parts of the world which have their own agenda. You know, yeah. th there is no question. Um, that say CNN or Reuters or the Associated Press, they are not going to write stories that uh, suggest, you know, the special bond between the Indian and Chinese people. They will write a story and it will be highly inflamed about a dispute that took place somewhere in some mountainous terrain 
where few mm-hmm. soldiers died. Let me tell you something that you may not be clear about: that more soldiers, more Indian soldiers, die of frostbite mm-hmm. up in the glaciers uh, mm-hmm. in the borderland region with Pakistan. More so, Indian soldiers die of frostbite every year than die from any other reason. Frostbite is the principal killer. Where are the stories about that? I mean, I believe, frankly, and I don't know if you agree with me, but I think that there should be a limit to where you can militarize. If if you're talking about the Himalayas, mm-hmm. I don't want to put a human being sitting at a border post where they're losing their toes to defend some rocks. I think that that's extremely inhumane to have Indian soldiers and Pakistani soldiers up in the high Himalayas. Western media is not going to do a story that more Indian soldiers die of frostbite than die of any armed conflict because it doesn't suit their agenda. And we accept their, their, their media as the real media. If the two sides can sit down and talk, I strongly believe there will be wisdom from the two sides. For instance, in China's discussion of land or sea border disputes with other countries, we even put forward this idea. Let's put aside uh, territorial disputes, sovereignty disputes. Let's jointly develop this particular disputed region and they share the profits. So there are all kinds of new ideas we can explore. Mm -hmm.